and welcome everybody to another Bangers and Classics podcast uh, with me, James Rupper, and him, David Malloy. Uh, David, what's going on? What's going on? Well, technical problems again today. Is there? Uh, yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. You were castigating me for my tardiness. Was I? Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, Every opportunity has to be taken, James. Okay. You know the rules. Mm. And, we, of course, the whole thing dropped out and mm. we lost everything that we recorded, which may be a great thing from the point of view of listeners, but yeah. not so great from our point of view. No, so, I don't know whether uh, you did that deliberately at all, David, but you did genuinely just drop out there. But there you go. <laughs> uh, um, I dropped out a long time ago, James. Yeah, I know. Well, this is it. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, drop, drop out without the narcotics, that's me. Yeah. Anyway, car spots. I was telling you that I saw just about nothing this week. Mm. There was one I couldn't remember. There was a very nice beetle that I've talked about before, uh, the one at the fast food place. And some weeks ago, there was a Series 1 Land Rover that I've not seen before nor since. So it must have been passing through. And that's it. Um, I can't say I've seen anything else. Even bangers, James, have been thin on the ground. No, I don't. That's terrible, terrible news. Um, mm. Yeah, I've, I've obviously been a lot luckier. Uh, 944 Cabriolet was a very nice open top. Uh, another open top was uh, a proper army Jeep. Um, it was all done up in uh, American colours. Uh, it was a proper early early version. There is somebody near to me who uh, does uh, dabble in all of that sort of stuff. So uh, it was not surprising to see it. Um, and uh, other than that, uh, bangers, which we don't talk about enough. Uh, I've been seeing quite a lot of uh, Toyota Corollas for some reason um, uh, come into my life. Toyota Carina as well. I don't come up, can't remember the last time I saw a Carina, but I did. Uh, in a car park when I was randomly looking for 90s cars, and that answered the uh, question. And also a Vauxhall Monterey, which, as everybody knows, is a um, uh, Isuzu Trooper, but with a Griffin on the front. So uh, uh, that was at a petrol station filling up with uh, diesel. So, uh, yeah, so I've seen a fair mm. amount of things, a, a broad spectrum. Mm. Lucky man, lucky man. Yeah. Well, I had one of my coincidental mishaps this week. I think I've told you this before. If you remember back in the 80s, there was a TV series called Chance in a Million. Yeah. That was a guy that things always kept happening to. Yeah. Well, for a few years, that could have been me. Oh, and then right. it stopped. And then yeah. it started again only occasionally. It's fairly infrequent. There was a time I was sent surf wax instead of a ring. Uh, I ordered the ring from my wife. It was a hammered uh, silver ring. And the people who made the ring instead, for some reason sent surfboard wax called sex wax. Oh, right. How the heck do you explain that to your wife? Uh, oh, is that isn't what I ordered, honest. Yeah, well, um, there you go. So, yeah, that was one. And another one has been very recently. I ordered, for reasons I may explain something again, I may, I may not, I ordered a book about U-boat losses off the Wigtonshire coast in World War I. Um, it's all connected with the boat. And imagine my surprise then. Well, instead of said opus, I received a book called The Scottish Music Hall, 1880 to 1900, something about which I have got absolutely no interest whatsoever. The people who sent the wrong book were, were very gracious, uh, gave me a refund and said, well, send the original book and give it to charity. Um, so uh, kudos to them for at least, you know, doing what they could to rectify the mistake uh, in a very nice and pleasant way. But uh, I do wonder sometimes at these things are meant to happen to me. There's, there's been a lot of them over the years. Most of them have now passed out of memory, but uh, I may tell you about one or two of them someday. Oh, right. Anyway, yeah. Yes. Now, well, personally, I'm, I'm waiting for uh, a couple of suspension spheres for my Mini, which uh, should have <laughs> arrived today. And uh, they don't seem to have done, because when they arrive, David, I'm I'm putting down the podcast and I'm off to deliver right. to the garage to uh, be fitted. But uh, uh, the postman hasn't called yet. Yeah. Postman always rings twice, James. Apparently so, but uh, that's only uh, if you're in a, uh, a film noir from the 1940s. Or there was a remake, wasn't there, with Jack there Nicholson? There was a remake with Jack yeah. Nicholson and uh, that woman. I can't remember her name. Sylvia Lang? Yeah, could be. I don't know. I think, it, like I, think, I think it was. We shall move on then, shall we, to... Yeah. Well, while you're hanging on, waiting for your s- suspension parts... Yeah, I am. You see what I did there? Yeah, no, I'm in suspense, obviously. Yeah, yeah, just keep you hanging on, baby. Yeah. Anyway, shall we move on to this week's banger or classic? Okay. And it's quite a niche one, I think, this Is week. It? But well, I think so. Mm-hmm. Um, they only made just over a thousand of them. Right. And it's the Rover 200 BRM. Mm. What do you make of that, James? Um, 
I think there's, you know, a lot that we can uh, sort of say it's, you know, it's not really a BRM and it's just some paint and stuff. Um, but I sort of miss these sorts of uh, cars, really. Uh, uh, I, I, I miss uh, sort of Rover from those days coming up with things like this. So, uh, yeah, um, in a way, it's like a bit of nonsense, really. It was um, nonsense marketing. Uh, but in another way, it's sort of fairly endearing, really, isn't it? The 200 is always a very curious vehicle anyway, mm. uh, which never fell into any sort of niche, really. No one was quite sure what it was, super mini or uh, a small family car or what. Uh, nobody really cared, really. Um, but I, I think this was quite an interesting um, sort of iteration. Um, and as you say, it's quite rare. And uh, it's a bit of fun, which uh, we don't seem to get these days. I wrote about it, James. Did you? In, I oh, did wow. in my tragically overlooked mm. book. Which one was that? Well, they're all tragically overlooked, James. Oh, they, oh, uh, really? Perhaps that's the point. Um, this one is the Ultimate Classic Car Quiz Book 2, which, if you know anything about these books, they're not really quiz books. They are quiz books, but there's a bit more to them. Um, there's some mini essays in them as well. Mm. And it talks about the over 200 BRM. I'm just giving you an answer to one of the questions. The story was, obviously, Rover produced the 200, didn't have a Halo model, as you know. Mm. They did produce uh, a coupe version, uh, but they also produced a limited edition of one called the Rover 200 VI, which is the 143 bhp fuel injected engine. They hark back to Rover's collaboration with BRM on the gas turbine-powered racing car, which competed twice at Le Mans in 1963 and 1965. I think Jackie Stewart drove it the second time. He was one of the drivers. Anyway, it was, it was a proof of concept car. Yeah, uh, seemed to get a decent response. They put the 200 BRM into production in 1998. Mm. As you say, James, it really owed nothing to BRM. Yeah, all you had was the name and the air intake in the front of the car was painted orange, as as many of the famous BRM racing cars. So that was it. What you did get for your money was a standard engine, but it got better suspension, lowered and stiffened, close ratio gearbox. Torsen differential, and you had red quilted leather seats and door panels, a red carpeting, a two-tone red and black steering wheel, and you got aluminium heater controls and trim. Hmm. It went okay, it handled pretty well, and it was too expensive. Yeah. They tried to, to sell it at uh, £18,000 at first, and it didn't sell. So they dropped the price to 16000 and for the month of September 1999 only, as far as I know, it was dropped to £13,495, which is quite a swinging discount. They built 1,115 of them, with about 800 being for the British market, 312 overseas. And today, there's around about 90 examples, or I should say today, when the book was written uh, last year, there was about 90 examples registered on the road with the DVLA, with another 250 or so being on SORN. And of course, all of them are the racing green with the, yeah. the orange air intake. I think it's quite a nice little car. Mm. I don't think it's any exceptional, but it's got charm, so it gets my thumbs up. And therefore, at least from this side of the, the podcast, it's a classic. Yeah, it is a classic, Danny, for the reasons mentioned. Right, well, that's that then. Your part's not arrived yet, James. I'm sorry, no, I'm not, no. But if we could go and have a lie down, I'd be grateful. Right. <laughs> oh, poor old James. I don't know, that's shocking. Right, what are we going to do next? Because I've lost my notes again. Have you lost your notes? Oh, yeah, okay. I keep I keep looking. Here we are. Um, I sent James uh, an email with notes about this week's podcast, what we're doing, basically, and it wasn't in my system, and it keeps disappearing. That's pretty much obvious. You know, I think from most weeks, you think these guys don't have any notes whatsoever. No. And yeah, you're probably right. But however, next item in the agenda, yeah. you know, cracking your fingernails in the background, yeah. uh, was we are going to have to choose, I think, a nautical theme for bangers and classics. Mm to celebrate the fact that we, we now have a boat. Um, and Mr. Corrugated, who is a regular correspondent uh, on Twitter, suggested that we should perhaps look at the Captain Pugwash theme, which is the trumpet mm. hornpipe as the nautical theme. Now, I don't know what you think of that, James, but I think we need to look at broaden our horizons beyond that a, a little. And I've got some ideas. Perhaps you've got some more. I think we should then debate them and choose one. Obviously, we've got Captain Pugwash. We've then got the theme tune, a very grand, very stately theme tune, I have to say, from uh, Van Gelis for the film 1492 Conquest of Paradise. We've then got uh, a sea shanty. We can't not have a sea shanty. 
And mm. I'm going back to my school days here when a chap whose nickname was Rummage volunteered uh, a sea shanty to a music teacher who was a, a poor, mousy little lady. Um, she must have had a terrible life from the absolute bunch of hooligans I went to school with. But she did ask for sea shanties to be not, to be named. And Rummage stopped and said, eh, frigging in the rigging, miss. So we'll go with frigging in the rigging. Uh, it's not really a she shanty, but in form, I suppose it is. Yeah. And the last one is described as true Scottish pirate metal, whatever mm-hmm. the heck that is. It's by a band called Alestorm, and it's Nancy the Tavern Wench. And I really rate it. I heard it in a bar in Glasgow one day some years ago, and I thought, what the heck is that? I like that. And there you go. I think it's an ideal theme tune for the Bangers and Classics fleet because it's mm. just absolutely out there. Uh, but what do you think, James? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, this isn't sort of my uh, uh, stuff, really, is it? Because uh, uh, I'm very much a, a land lover, and uh, you know, all the uh, uh, all the adventures are, are at sea are going to be down down to you. So, um, you, you know, pugwash is as far as I ever got uh, to uh, uh, being on the water. So, I think that's a very good su- suggestion, subject to copyright, of course. But uh, no, I, I think you've come up with some very Grand uh, suggestions there. Yeah, it'd be nice to have some sweeping majestic theme, um, which is uh, you know appropriate for uh, a podcast of our you know huge standing. Um, <laughs> rather than someone probably playing playing a penny whistle with uh, the sea crashing in the background or dribbling in the background. Well, so, yeah. <laughs> the, so the person playing the, pen, the uh, penny whistle yeah. would probably be dribbling in the background. They could be. I expect it would be. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, so, yeah, I mean, as usual, David, you come up with all the good suggestions, so I'm quite happy to go along with that. Right, Nancy the Tavern Wench it is. Yeah. I, I genuinely suggest people, you check this out on YouTube. It's it's mad, but it's good. I'm not saying we're mad, but good, but we're certainly halfway there. So, mm. And I think on that note, I think it's time for us to take a break and let's get ready to repel borders and yeah. indeed day pupils as well. You are listening to Bangers and Classics, the only motoring podcast presented by James, maker of the world's finest fake beards, Rupert, and David doesn't know the difference between Jessica and Sylvia Malloy. And we are back after the break. For the next completely wacky idea we've got for this podcast, which is Abandoned Ideas. And I've got one for you, James. This is something yeah. that happened, and I remember it from the 1970s from being a kid. Mm. Uh, you might remember it too. Uh, I think it was the M1, and the Transport and Road Research Laboratory had a road surface that effectively chirped as you drove, as you drove mm. over. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah, I am aware of that. Yes, yeah, there was yeah. something bizarre oh. like that. Yeah, I mean, you used to drive. We driving along the motorway. Mm. I was too far too young. I was sitting in the back, but there'd be a sign and a picture of a road and musical notes hovering above it. And you drove along, you know, as I say, an open section of the uh, M1, and you get all of these rather strange noises coming from the tyres. Hmm. That, that was rather wonderful. I can't remember what the purpose of it was now, and I've not really um, found, much, found out much about it. I, I did look one day, and I couldn't really see very much. It was, it was an experiment that seems to have been lost in the, the realms of time. But I rather liked it. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, you've got me thinking about road mm. services and there, there used to be, and I don't know um, if they were in your part of the world as well, but um, they used to um, also uh, cast great big blocks of concrete, um, which were um, used as roads and they were on major roads. I think they were on motorways and also A, a roads. Mm. So uh, you would actually, it, it was like driving over huge tiles. Um, so you would actually go thump, thump, thump sort of all the, all the way and it was also a different colour it wasn't tarmac coloured it was a lighter colour yeah it was grey wasn't it yeah it was quite light grey yeah yeah they still have some of those kicking mm. about I'm sure uh, they do Norfolk I'm sure James is going to say surely not but yeah I was driving through Norfolk a mm. few years ago um, coming home from somewhere and I was driving along and I thought this road surface is very different it was light grey and as you say James mm. it was concrete I just can't remember for life of me where it was but it was actually quite pleasant to drive on, I yeah. have to say. Yeah, yeah, so right, I, yeah. I, I liked it, yeah. Hmm. You don't, well, you don't see many of these surfaces now, but yeah. one or two seemingly do still exist, or at least they did until a few years ago. So if you know of any, do tell us, because we would love to hear that. Well, we'd like uh, to go and drive there. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, of course. Well, the problem with you and me, James, yeah. um, me being 
because I'm underprivileged and living far from all of these things. But yeah, that would be it would be good to go and see and go and experience again. Obviously, another abandoned idea was the quartic steering wheel mm. as fitted to the Austin Allegro. Why do you think they did that, James? Uh, I don't know. Nobody knows, uh, really, do they? Um, I think it was supposed to enhance the driving experience or something. Um, that we did. There was one in our family, um, an Allegro with one of those. It was a very early Allegro, uh, which didn't last very long, actually. It, it sort of expired very, very quickly. Uh, but yeah, I think the Quartic steering wheel wasn't it. They just thought it made it sort of easier to drive, sort of thing. But it's a bit like the the um, uh, the Tesla um, uh, steering wheel, isn't it? I mean, that's like a small rectangle, isn't it? On the uh, can't 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 you specify one which is like a very weird looking sort of aircraft style um, one. Um, so it's a bit it's a bit like that. But yeah, but also wasn't um, I think it wasn't originally intended for the Rover. Uh, SD1. Uh, pass. Don't know. Yeah, I've got a vague recollection it was, and they obviously abandoned it for that. I don't know. But uh, yeah, no, it was a daft idea. Uh, steering wheels really should be round, shouldn't they? Mm. Absolutely. <clears throat> Ideally. But, uh, quartic steering wheel wasn't a success. Mm. Uh, it's not remembered with any great affection. But uh, what about the next thing on our list, James? And final roofs? Yeah, but I remember vinyl roofs. Yeah, yeah rust, rust traps, weren't they? Yeah, apparently so. Um, yeah. But there was, but there was also ones which were a bit like sideburns, where you where you had the vinyl um, just on the um, uh, on the rear pillar. Um, yeah, so they weren't a- a- anywhere else, and uh, always I didn't mind those. I thought those were quite stylish. But uh, yeah, sometimes uh, yeah. you get vinyl sort of quarter roof, so just not even the rear pillar. Yeah, no, the, that's right. The rear the rear section of the roof, uh, and the, the uh, obviously the C pillars would be covered in vinyl, but none of the rest of it. No, that's right. There is a. I think it was that was an old um, uh, uh, sort of coachwork um, uh, uh, design, uh, which I, I did research and write an article on. But obviously, once I've written it, I've forgotten everything. But uh, <laughs> yeah, um, I think that's where that that actually comes from. That design is that it's it, it's a bit like a you know like a uh, uh, a roof of a of a pony and trap sort of thing um yeah very yeah. very weird really but uh, mm. uh it's a bit like those american cars which uh because they sort of had those didn't they they had bizarre vinyl roofs as well as the old uh, plastic wood slapped down the side and stuff like that but yeah they would really go over the top uh, yeah i quite yeah and you would have like uh portholes um coming back to the nautical theme um um on like a lincoln continental wouldn't you or the uh Toronado, I think it might have been, wasn't it? Um, yeah. Yeah. And that was, uh, so yeah, you would have vinyl plus a little porthole. And uh, really, when you think about it now, you just think, well, that's bizarre, isn't it? But uh, that's what they yeah. did. The whole thing was bizarre. I mean, vinyl roofs, I just don't get the whole mm. idea behind them. Yeah. Um, it used to be, certainly even into, well into the 70s, that um, if you were buying you know, a normal family car, the higher spec models came with vinyl with. I suppose they were offered as a delete option as well. You could say, I don't want, want a vinyl with from my Alpine GLS. Thank you very much. For life, I don't get it at all. They looked ridiculous. Yeah, well, there um, were flares then as well, David, as well. And it's, it's hard to make a case for flares, really. But uh, although you've got a lot more material for your money, so I suppose with that, you got yeah. paid for extra material to go over your head. Oh. Well, well, flares are quite handy if you're going to distress at sea, I suppose. Oh, absolutely. When I was thinking flares, David, I was thinking about trouser flares, but, you know, there you go. I know you, know. I, I know you were. <laughs> of course. <clears throat> I mean, blame it, I knew some guys, that was the only flare they had was the one yeah. at the bottom of their trousers. There you go. Probably applies to me as well, actually, mm. I think of it. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> before we take a break, there's a bangers and classic public information announcement to be made. Yeah. I'm afraid so. Uh, there, was a, there was a chap I used to, to know a little bit who owned several Chrysler 180 and 2 litres. And I think he had about five of these at one point. He was never, ever seen, to my knowledge, to, to drive them. Had kept them in various garages around about Ayrshire. Uh, was restoring them. And the story I've heard is that he wanted to restore them to perfection. He was a very talented welder, so it was quite possible he could have restored them to a very, very high degree indeed. Unfortunately, the lad in question uh, seems to have passed away a few years ago um, at a young age. I'd lost touch with him then. I, I don't know how long ago it was, but someone told me at a car show that uh, sadly he was no longer with us. 
the reason for making the announcement is I've also been told that these cars are now in a scrapyard in the vicinity. Now, I'm going to go and check this out. But if anyone's interested in a Chrysler 180 or a 2 litre, or at least getting some parts from them, um, stay tuned to the podcast because I'll try and find out what I can, uh, see if any of them might be you know, saveable or if they're capable of yielding some useful parts because parts for these cars are going to be horrifically rare, like the cars themselves. And I know that the, the lad in question would love them to live on in some way. So if we could perhaps do that much, it would be a good thing, I think. Anyway, let's move on to a break. We regret to inform you that this year's Bangers and Classics convention has been cancelled as the phone box in question has been double booked. And you join us for the final segment of this week's podcast. And we're going to kick that off with a challenge. And there's no budgetary constraints in this one. The only constraint is that the vehicle in question must be drivable. It doesn't even have to be uh, in the UK. Uh, even on planet Earth, we'll, we'll accept one of the extraterrestrial, don't care. The challenge is to buy the most pointlessly opulent classic car you can find. And there are various bonus points for finding things which, uh, such as a hot tub, a dartboard, or a proper Italian coffee maker. But uh, I'm sure there's other things as well we'll give bonus points for. Anyway, what's Mr. Ruppert got? I'm desperate to know. Uh, well, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's all too easy to find um, hot tubs in cars these days. Um, so um, what I went for, and actually, um, obviously, I'm a cheapskate, so uh, budget is uh, always important to me. Uh, but for 11999 I could get a, a, a 2008 uh, Toyota Century. Um, it's a 5-litre V12, and it's got um, uh, all the uh, bits and bobs on it. So it's, you know, massaging rear seats and uh, air rear seats. I mean, it's a fairly old car, but actually it's got absolutely everything you could ever want. Massage seats, yeah, and uh, um, uh, uh, all of that sort of stuff. And, uh, yeah, I just think, it's a it's a fairly pointless car because it's a upmarket Toyota that nobody would really care about. But um, I think you can have a lot of fun with it, and uh, you can't hear the engine because it's a V12, and uh, it'll last forever because it's a Toyota. So yeah, I thought for twelve thousand, and uh, I can keep the rest. Um, that would work out very very well. But uh, you might think it's rather pedestrian and boring, but uh, I really don't care, David. Well, I went OTT with this one. Did you? <laughs> oh yeah. I decided to go for something completely and utterly ludicrous. It's a car called the American Dream. And in the original guys, it was 100 feet long. It's now added an inch and a half to that. Uh, it's a limousine, which is based on Cadillacs. Cadillac Eldorados, I believe we used it. Uh, something like six were conjoined. Um, it was conceived by a guy called Jay Orberg, uh, Californian. And apparently he designed cars such as Kit from Knight Rider and indeed the DeLorean Time Machine from Back to the Future. This was something completely different, though. This is a vehicle, and you're going to love this, originally swiveled in the middle so it could navigate corners. It had a helipad on the tail, but if it wasn't being used as a helipad, you could use it as a putting green. Originally it had two engines, obviously loads of windows, TVs, telephones, a lounge, a water bed, a jacuzzi, and, get this, a swimming pool with a diving board. Goodness me. Absolutely. Now, it unfortunately uh, went to seed, and it was in a really bad state a few years ago. But the good news is it has been restored, and it will be made available if anyone wants to purchase it, and it will be finished according to their specification, I believe. They say there's room inside for 75 people, so that's the entire Bangers and Classic audience, uh, plus about 73 of their friends. Which, which is great. And you can land your helicopter on it. You can go for a swim. You could have a pool table in it, I suppose, as well. Yeah. Yeah. So so, so are you going to be buying that then, David? You... Um, unfortunately, I had looked down the back of the sofa. Yeah. And all I found was a note from the cleaner saying, dear sir, we couldn't remove the uh, stains from your suit. Instead yeah. of the couple of million quid I hope to find down there. So, yeah, a bit disappointing that. So, unfortunately, no, I can't buy it. Oh, but uh, a man of your means, that would be pocket change to James. Mm. I think you should go out and buy it and rue the bangers and classics listener base with it. I really do. Right. But are you, are you going to do that then? No, I doubt say it, but it'd be quite a good <laughs> um, mini cab though, wouldn't it, I would have thought. Yeah. Uh, I suppose if you live in a place with no corners. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you know, the, line, the linear yeah. mini cab company, that's it. 
Exactly. Yeah, it's a yeah. bit more of a hen night special, really. I suppose I'm, I'm sure you could uh, make a yeah, living. You, you're cooking your chickens there, my boy. Well, there you go. All seventy five of them. Yeah. Yeah. So there we go. That's the most pointlessly opulent car I can think of. And yeah, there's something great about it. I mean, I don't really like hen night specials, etc. But this one, yeah, I'm prepared to forgive because it's just so OTT. And that leaves us with one more thing to do this week. Oh, really? It's, yeah, I've got to go back to the danger zone, James. All oh, right. <laughs> yep, it's the FSO Polonaise. Oh, well. Do you remember that? I do, I do, absolutely. Um, it's basically uh, uh, the FSO Polonaise with um, a hatchback on it, really, and or, or a more unattractive body um, plumped on top. So there you go. Um, yeah. I, mean, yeah, I don't think it handled any better or anything, so... No, well, this was in production for a long time. It was, yeah. Yeah, it was uh, produced for over 20 years, I believe. Yeah. Uh, based, as you say, it's a base of the uh, Polsky Fiat 125P that was built in Poland under licence from Fiat. They gave it... Um, I would hesitate to call it a party frock, but they gave it a hatchback body. They did and otherwise retained the mechanical and other configuration of the, uh, the car that gave birth to it. However, it did come to the UK. They were sold here. I remember when it was launched here. I remember when the local guy just sold it, and they had bunting and flags and everything up. So, oh, yeah, wow. God, yeah. Polonaise is here. He? What the heck's that? And, uh, well, unfortunately, I don't think the, the buying public in the area shared their excitement because I was seldom saw any around. Uh. In fact, the company, I think, moved on to become dealers for another mark fairly shortly afterwards. <laughs> There's not much more I can say about it, really. It's it's a somewhat ungainly vehicle. It's not the best handling vehicle in the world. It's not the best looking vehicle. But, you know, it was cheap. Um, yeah. It was roomy, and it would do the job. These cars, they're not glamorous. They're not exciting. But I always think it's a shame if they just end up as uh, items in a scrapyard, you know, bits of rusting metal. So, you know, someone, someone needs to love them. So hopefully uh, anyone listening to this thinking, well, you know, wouldn't mind a basic car, just something that's a little bit different. Again, festival, the unexceptional material. Turn up in a really nice polonaise and you, you can have a good chance of winning it. Yeah. I don't know. What do you think, James? Yeah, I suppose so. Yeah, I'm a bit under, under, underwhelmed uh, by them all, really. But, uh, yeah, it would, uh, it would be uh, 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 an interesting thing to have. Um, yeah. Uh, obviously, I had it. I, I owned the previous model, which was really awful. So, I would I would presume this would just be really aw- awful as well, but slightly more practical. Anyway, I think that's uh, it for this week, James. I mean, I don't know how long we've done this week. Uh, obviously, we're, the time we're spending this has been carefully watched by Mister Corrugated. Hmm. If, if we go under twenty minutes, uh, it doesn't meet with favour, and if we go over thirty minutes, that also doesn't meet with favour. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Anyway, thanks very much for listening. Take care and hope to see you next time. Yeah, cheerio, everybody.